And we'll move on to Professor Sophia Lunt. Uh, she is a professor at Michigan State University in the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Department. Uh, and her, she studies metabolism in cancer proliferation, heterogeneity, and metastases. And today she's going to speak to us about deciphering metabolic rewiring. Well, thank you to the organizers for this great symposium and the opportunity to present our research today. We've known for a long time that cancer cells have fundamentally different metabolism than normal cells, but we have yet to understand why. Almost a century ago, in 1926, a famous German biochemist named Otto Warburg observed that unlike normal cells that take up glucose, one of our favorite forms of sugar, and convert it to carbon dioxide, cancer cells take up a lot more glucose and they convert it into lactate. Now this process is very confusing from an energy point of view because if you take glucose and oxidize it into carbon dioxide using the oxygen we breathe in and our mitochondria, you can generate up to 36 ATP molecules, the energy currency of the cell. But if you ferment glucose into lactate, you only get up to two ATPs. Normal cells can also ferment glucose to lactate, but they only do it when they're limited for oxygen. Like when you're sprinting and you're unable to deliver oxygen to your muscles, your muscle cells will start fermenting glucose to lactate, you get lactic acid buildup, and you get that muscle burn. But cancer cells do this all the time, even when they have plenty of oxygen available. And because it doesn't make sense from an energy point of view, Otto Warburg concluded that cancer arises from defective mitochondria, that cancer cells are forced to do this inefficient metabolism. But it turns out he didn't quite get that right. Cancer cells very much depend on their mitochondria, and if you inhibit their mitochondrial function or you remove their mitochondria, cancer cells get very sick, they'll stop growing, or they'll die. But before we could solve the mystery of the Warburg effect, the focus of the research field shifted away from cancer metabolism and more into genes. And this is partially because of the discovery of P53, the guardian of the human genome, or all genomes. And of course, P53 is deleted or mutated in more than half of human cancers. Also bringing focus to genes is the Human Genome Project. So the field became very interested in genes rather than metabolism. But in recent years, people have started becoming interested in metabolism again, and there are several reasons for this. One, it turns out these genes, tumor suppressors and oncogenes, actually directly impact metabolism. For example, PI3K, AKT, mTOR, and various other uh, signaling pathways and genes affect glycolysis, which is responsible for that conversion of glucose to lactate. SRABP is important for lipid metabolism. mTOR and MYC are important for glutamine metabolism and also for nucleotide biosynthesis. In addition, we realized that we can take advantage of that Warburg effect, that different metabolism, to image and detect cancers. So we can give patients radioactively labeled glucose and Organs that really like glucose will concentrate that radioactively labeled glucose, and then it, that organ will light up in a PET scan. So the pancreas normally doesn't like a lot of glucose, but in this case, this patient has pancreatic cancer. It's taking up a lot of the glucose, and you can see that it's lighting up in the PET scan, and we're able to diagnose the patient with pancreatic cancer. So it's great that we can take advantage of altered metabolism to detect tumors, but of course we want to take it a step further and use it to actually treat cancer. We further realized that we've actually been using anti-metabolites to treat cancer for a long time. So anti-metabolites are chemicals that structurally mimic biologically active compounds. So on the left here, you can see the structure of folic acid, a biologically active molecule, which is very important for rapidly proliferating cells. On the right, you have the structure of a anti-metabolite, methotrexate, one of the first chemotherapeutic agents ever to be used. And it looks almost exactly like folic acid with the exception of a few atoms. And because it's structurally similar, it will competitively bind to the active site of metabolic enzymes. But because it's not quite right, those enzymes can't complete that reaction. So you have this competitive inhibition of important metabolic enzymes and cells are not able to divide. In addition to methotrexate, there are several other anti-metabolites like pometrexate, gemcitabine, and 5-fluorouracil. 
and they're used to treat a wide variety of cancers. But the problem with these agents is that they're not specific to rapidly proliferating cancer cells. They target all rapidly proliferating cells. So we need to improve these anti-metabolites and target pathways that's only upregulated in rapidly proliferating cancer cells. So the fact that genes and oncogenes, tumor suppressors affect metabolism, that we can use metabolism to image and detect cancers, and that anti-metabolites can be used to treat cancer has brought attention back to metabolism and alter metabolism and deregulating cellular energetics is now considered an emerging hallmark of cancer. In addition, we now have tools that Otto Warburg didn't have to study metabolism. We have access to extremely sophisticated mass spectrometers that can detect hundreds to thousands of metabolites in a single run. We also have precise genetic engineering tools like CRISPR-Cas9. So in my lab, we're using these new tools that are available to further probe cancer metabolism and figure out what pathways are really upregulated in cancer cells in hopes of generating the next generation of cancer therapeutics. So I'd like to tell you about three projects going on in the lab. Um, first, target metabolic pathways in metastasis, then looking at cancer heterogeneity and personalized medicine, and finally, working on some new imagers and therapeutics. So the first project is spearheaded by an outstanding postdoc in my lab, Xiao Ting Teo. Metastasis causes up to 90% of cancer-related deaths. So for example, in breast cancer, if you have early stage breast cancer, your five-year survival rate is almost 100%. But the problem is most of these early stage breast cancer patients will eventually develop metastatic disease. And of course, when you have late stage breast cancer, that five-year survival rate plummets to about 20%. So if we want to save cancer deaths, then we have to target metastasis. So we wanted to know what metabolic pathways support metastatic cancer cells. And to answer this question, we didn't want to just study one model because those, that one model might have certain metabolic pathways that are unique to that model. So we wanted to study lots of models and find ubiquitous, uh, uh, ubiquitous um, metabolic pathways that's common in all metastatic cancers. So what we did was team up with Kent Hunter at the National Cancer Institute, and we crossed a highly metastatic mouse model of breast cancer, the MMTB polyoma middle T model, and we crossed it with a wide variety of different backgrounds. And what we got were progeny that all develop breast tumors, but they have very different metastatic potentials. So some of them will develop lots of metastases, and others will not develop very many metastases. So for example, if we look at the FBB background, it develops a certain number of metastases, and we'll call that uh, a metastatic index of one. But if we go to a different background, the MOLF background, then they develop much fewer mets, a five-fold decrease, with a metastatic index of 0.2. Yet another background, the CAST background, will develop almost twice as many metastases. So what we did was take all these progeny, map them into a phylogenetic tree, and we wanted to find pairs where they were phylogenetically very closely related, but with very different metastatic potentials. So we wanted to keep things as similar as possible with the only difference really being metastatic potential. And one matched pair is the BL6 and BL10, where they are phylogenetically related, but one is highly metastatic, the other is not metastatic. Another matched pair is the CAST and MOLF pair. Again, one is highly metastatic and the other is not. Then we compare these matched pairs to identify universal features of high metastatic tumors. So we use mass spectrometry to look at the metabolic profiles, and here are the results. So we found several metabolites that were consistently different in the highly metastatic models. And one metabolite in particular got our attention, and that's sialic acid. Sialic acid was consistently accumulated in high metastatic tumors. Sialic acid is made from glucose, so perhaps the Warburg effect is partially to support sialic acid metabolism. And sialic acid is used to modify cell surface proteins to affect cell-cell adhesion and also interaction with the immune cells. 
And so we thought it might play an important role in cancer metastasis. So we wanted to look into it further. And to do this, we moved on to cancer cell lines because they're a lot easier and more cost effective to work with as far as looking at metabolic fluxes and also doing genetic engineering studies. So we took a well-established highly metastatic breast cancer cell line called 4T1 and its matched counterpart, which is much less metastatic, called 4T07. And we compared their metabolic profiles to first confirm that they also have higher levels of sialic acid in the highly metastatic part. And that is exactly what we see. So the highly metastatic cell line has higher levels of sialic acid and also its downstream product, CMP sialic acid. So CMP sialic acid is actually the activated form of sialic acid, and that's what cells use to modify their cell surface proteins. So both are higher, and further, its upstream um, precursor, UDP and acetylglucosamine, is lower, perhaps indicating that cells are using more of this precursor to make their sialic acid and CMP sialic acid. So we wanted to know if their metabolic fluxes are also actually higher. And to do this, we wanted to perform steady isotope labeling studies. So steady isotope labeling studies are basically pulse chase studies um, where we can get a, a measure of metabolic flux through a pathway. So here we have glucose, and you take it through the sialic acid biosynthesis pathway to make UDP and acetylglucosamine. Eventually, you make sialic acid and CMP sialic acid, which is then used to modify cell surface proteins. So glucose has carbon-12. That's the naturally occurring isotope. But what we can do is label each of those carbons with carbon-13. So carbon-13 has an extra neutron, and the mass spec can tell the difference between carbon-12 and carbon-13 glucose. So we feed cells with carbon-13 labeled glucose, and cells start eating it, and they start incorporating into the sialic acid pathway. And then the sialic acid precursors um, and all the metabolites in that pathway become labeled. And if we see a rate of increase of 13C labeled sialic acid and 13C labeled CMP sialic acid, that should reflect a higher metabolic flux through that pathway. And when we did this experiment, this is what we see. In addition to having higher levels of both sialic acid and CMP sialic acid, the highly metastatic breast cancer cells also make sialic acid and CMP sialic acid faster. So they do have higher flux through this pathway, perhaps indicating that this pathway is very important for cancer metastasis. So we wanted to know if this has any clinical relevance. And to do this, we looked at patient data sets, and we wanted to know if there's any correlation between expression of genes in this pathway and their overall survival. So we looked at two important genes in this pathway. The first is GNE, that's the first committed step in sialic acid biosynthesis. And then the second is CMAS, that's the rate limiting step in sialic acid um, biosynthesis. And when we look at expression of those genes and patient survival, indeed we see that higher expression of those genes is associated with lower overall survival. It's also associated with lower distant metastasis free survival meaning patients that have high expression of genes in this pathway will develop metastases faster, and they also die faster. To further confirm the importance of this pathway, we performed in vivo studies. So we knocked out CMAS in the highly metastatic cell lines, injected them back into mice, and these mice all develop uh, breast tumors in the primary site in the mammary fat pad, but they have very different metastases. So you can see the wild type cells form lots of lung metastases, but if we knock out that gene in the sialic acid pathway, much of that metastases is gone. They never develop. Same thing with the second highly metastatic cell line, 6DT1. Wild type cells form lots of lung metastases. Knockout cells form very few metastases. And we can quantitate this, and we do see a statistically significant reduction in lung metastases. So comparing breast tumors revealed metastasis-associated metabolites, and specifically we found that sialic acid metabolism is important for highly metastatic tumors. And targeting this pathway decreases the metastatic capability of the tumors. 
Next, I'd like to tell you about heterogeneity and personalized therapy, which is led by an excellent graduate student in the lab, Martin Nogorodzinski. So cancer is a heterogeneous disease, and breast cancer especially is a very heterogeneous disease. So you can classify breast cancer a number of different ways, for example, by hormone receptor status or gene expression profiles or histology. But no matter how you do it, you can see that their prevalence rates are different, their survival rates are different, and targeted therapy options are different. And in some cases, like triple negative breast cancer, there is no targeted therapy available. The other thing is that different subtypes of breast cancer have different metabolic preferences. Some t sim seem to prefer glycolysis, some seem to prefer to use glutamine, others seem to prefer lipids, and so we wanted to further probe this. And to do this, we teamed up with Aaron Andercheck at MSU to study a mouse model that mimics the heterogeneity found in human breast cancer. So this is the mmtb mic mouse model of breast cancer, and these mice form tumors that all look very different when you look at them under a microscope. So some look like this, called microacinar, some look like papillary, EMT, others have very mixed histology. In addition, these subtypes have very different gene expression profiles. So the papillary subtype will upregulate genes in these signaling pathways, but those same genes are downregulated in the EMT subtype. So we decided to focus on those two subtypes and see what are their metabolic differences. Do they have any? And so we used mass spectrometry, again, to look at their metabolic profiles, and that's shown in this heat map, where yellow means those metabolites are higher in the EMT subtype, and blue means metabolite, metabolites are lower in the EMT subtype. And what we found is that many of these metabolites that are different between the two subtypes are involved in nucleotide metabolism. More specifically, it seemed like EMT have higher levels of nucle nucleotide triphosphates and lower levels of nucleotide monophosphates. So then we performed steady isotope labeling studies on the two subtypes to see if their fluxes might be different. And indeed, we find that one subtype prefers to have higher rate of flux through the pyrimidine pathway, making their nucleotide pyrimidines, whereas the other subtype has higher flux through the purine pathway. So it seemed like this nucleotide pathway was something that was differentiating these two subtypes. So we further looked at genes that are involved in nucleotide metabolism. And what we found is that the papillary subtype have higher expression of genes in de novo biosynthesis of nucleotides, meaning they prefer to make their own nucleotides from glucose, whereas the other subtype has higher expression of genes in the salvage pathway. So this subtype doesn't want to make their own nucleotides. They want to salvage nucleotide precursors from their environment and convert them into the nucleotides they need. So we started putting all of this together. So we have glucose here, which is upregulated by the Warburg effect, right? And you take it into the pentose phosphate pathway, and you can go upward to make your pyrimidines, or you can go downward to make your purines. And genes highlighted here in red are genes that are upregulated in the papillary subtype of breast tumors. So they're upregulating all these de novo biosynthesis genes. Now in the EMT subtype, they upregulate genes in the salvage pathway. So instead of using glucose, they're going to use precursors like citidine, uracil, and thiamine and convert them into the nucleotides they need. One has higher flux to pyrimidines, the other higher flux to purines. One has higher levels of monophosphates, the other has higher levels of triphosphates. So at this point, we decided to target some of these genes using CRISPR. So we decided to target genes in the de novo biosynthesis pathway, one in pyrimidine biosynthesis, one in purine biosynthesis. We also decided to target genes in the salvage pathway, one in nucleotide uh, pyrimidine salvage, the other in uh, purine salvage. And this is what we see. So this is the growth rate of a wild-type tumor for the EMT subtype in black. And in gray, we have a GFP control as a, a CRISPR-Cas9 control. Then for the EMT subtype, since they really like their salvage pathways, we targeted those genes with CRISPR, and we expected these tumors to grow much slower since we're targeting a pathway that they really like. 
And indeed, that's what we see. So you can see when we target the pathway they like, they grow much slower. Next, we targeted genes that they actually don't care about, which is the de novo biosynthesis genes. And at this point, we uh, um, expected that these tumors would grow the same as wild type because they don't care about that pathway. But what we actually saw is that those tumors grow even faster. So it seems like if you target a pathway they don't care about, it helps the tumor cells and it allows them to grow even faster. So our results indicate that if you have a tumor that looks like this, like the papillary subtype, then you want to target the de novo nucleotide biosynthesis pathway. If you have a tumor that looks like this, the EMP subtype, then you want to target the salvage pathway. And if you target the wrong pathway, you're actually going to make things much worse for the patient and make the tumors grow even faster. So we find that histological subtypes of breast cancer display distinct metabolism. And in our case, we find that the papillary subtype upregulates de novo biosynthesis, and EMT upregulates the salvage pathway. And these unique metabolic pre preferences can be exploited for therapy. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to tell you about a new exciting project going on in our lab where we're trying to develop fluorescent molecules um, for next generation cancer imaging and therapy. And this is led by a talented graduate student in my lab, uh, Deanna Broadwater, and it's in cl collaboration with Richard Lunt and Bob Borhan at MSU. Fluorescent agents are photosensitizers that become activated by a specific wavelength of light to either kill cancer cells, image cancer cells, or guide surgeons in image-guided therapy. Fluorescent agents hold great promise in biomedicine because, in theory, the photosensitizer itself should be completely harmless. The light used to activate that photosensitizer is also completely harmless. But when you bring the two together at a specific site where you have a tumor, then it should become harmful and kill the cancer cells right at that site. Now, in practice, it's not quite true. So most of the photosensitizers available in the market today are not completely harmless. They actually have a lot of nonspecific toxicity. And for example, patients receiving photofrin have to avoid bright light for weeks. Otherwise, their normal cells start getting damaged. Also, they have limited utility for imaging because they have limited penetration depths. So agents that are active in the visible light only penetrate micrometers into tissue, so you can only detect tumors that are very close to the skin. You're not able to detect tumors that are embedded deep within the body. So to increase this penetration range, what we're doing is developing fluorophores that are active in the near-infrared range. So agents available on the market today largely are active in the visible range, so that's 400 to 700 nanometers. And the problem is, is that within those wavelengths, 400 to 700 nanometers, we have many biological compounds like water, melanin, and hemoglobin that also absorb those wavelengths. But, oops, if we move deeper into the spectrum into the near-infrared range, then the absorbance by our biological molecules fall by orders of magnitude. You have much less autofluorescence, much less background noise, and you can actually penetrate centimeters into blood, skin, and bone. So by using near-infrared systems, we can fix the limited penetration problem. Well, what about the toxicity problem? Well, to solve the toxicity problem, we're borrowing a concept that was actually discovered in solar cell research by Richard Lund. He discovered that when you take a fluorescent agent and you pair it with various counterions, you can modulate their electronic properties. So we thought, if you can do that in solar cells, we should be do, able to do this in cancer cells, where we modulate their electronic properties to control what reactive species they generate or not generate which should make them either toxic or not toxic. So we can tune them to be highly toxic for photodynamic therapy, which would be perfect for therape therapeutic agents, or we can tune them to be non-toxic for imaging. And so we've been doing some preliminary studies in, my, in our labs for this, and we're getting some very exciting results. So in this graph here, we're showing viable cells on the y-axis. So if you see cells on top, that means cells are growing. And if you see cells in this bottom gray area, it means cells are dying. And on the x-axis, we have increased 
uh, fluorophore concentration. And then on the left, we're showing cytotoxicity, meaning toxicity in the dark, just non-specific toxicity. And on the right, we're showing phototoxicity. So this is toxicity after you shine light. And when we take a fluorescent agent and pair them with ions here on the red, um, on the left, this reddish color, you see that they're, they're actually quite cytotoxic and they're phototoxic. So we don't really want to use these for anything because they'll just have nonspecific toxicity and cause a lot of side effects. But if we move to counter ions in the middle here, um, shown in this yellowish color, you see that we get rid of that cytotoxicity, but we have beautiful phototoxicity. So these would be perfect for therapeutic agents where you have no side effects unless you shine light at a specific site that you want to control, then you can kill the cells at that specific site. Finally, if we use counter ions at the very right here in this bluish color, we have no cytotoxicity, we have very little phototoxicity, and that's only at very high concentrations, and these would be ideal for imaging because you could image the whole body, you could um, light, shine light on the whole body without worrying about damaging any cells. So we're very excited to explore this further, and we're also starting to get some exciting in vivo data. So hopefully next time I can give you an update on this project. So we find that near-infrared fluorophores have great potential in biomedicine, and ion pairing enables a platform for tuning cellular toxicity. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone that contributed, all the wonderful graduate students and postdocs in my lab, our great collaborators both at MSU and the National Cancer Institute, our funding agencies, and I'd like to thank former Vice President Joe Biden and his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, for their continued support of cancer research. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Um, do we have questions for Sophia? We can probably do a quick one here. Do you have any idea of the mechanism by which sialic acid promotes metastasis? Um, we th so it's this, um, it modifies cell surface proteins. We think immune cells are um, involved. Um, you don't think it's the mesenchymal whatever transition? Because most, most be metastases, that. most cancers are metastasized. I mean, maybe most of the cells get there, but very few actually can, can convert the, the, the new host cell into a tumor cell. If maybe the sialic acidization of the cell surface proteins is the key to that conversion. Yes, it could be. Um, uh, my postdoc, Xiao, is right here, so he might be able to shed more light on that. I don't think, yeah, we quite understand the mechanism, but yeah, it could be the interaction with the microenvironment. It could be immune cells. Um, I mean, if you could, you could look for inhibitors of that particular process, you might have a new cancer drug. Yes, yes, that's true. Okay, let's thank Sophia again. <laughs>